We sell use cases specifically in the financial services sector uh, to banks and lenders, and we also have you know, other industry agnostic tools that we also sell across. Welcome to the Under 30 Summit. I am joined with Galil Bishbishi, COO of Synapse Analytics. Welcome, it's a pleasure. Thank you, pleasure's all mine. Uh, first of all, congratulations on being an under 30 lister. You're one of the unique people who actually opted to go the entrepreneurship route right after graduating. So talk to us about this. Yeah, well, I, I graduated as a mechanical engineer. I was in the US at the time. I uh, spent four years there and then I, I came back actually to fulfill my army duty. Um, you know, and uh, the compulsory, obviously, it's, it's mandatory. And then um, uh, I was able to actually, I, had, I was very fortunate to meet my partner within that time uh, and we, uh, we hit it off very quickly and he, we go way back as well uh, through you know um, maybe uh, one of his family relatives, his brother actually is one of my closest friends. That's so. wonderful. AI has been this like massive trending topic throughout 2023 and even going into 2024 everybody is obsessed with it. So for those who are not aware how does it work? How does your service and your product work? Okay, so let's take a step back when, uh, I mean, there's a lot of hype obviously around AI and specifically the last year as well. Um, so when, when people talk about AI, the main difference between AI and traditional software, AI is, is software written by data, right? Uh, or it's code written by data. When you talk about traditional software, it's really just the same piece of code, right? Written by humans and with their inter intelligence and interpretation. So this is really the main differentiator. So if you have a bunch of data and there's a lot of patterns and predictive signals inside of it, very easy for you. I mean, easy, but I mean, you can easily uh, deploy an AI model around it and then get, get high uh, accuracy or efficacy out of it. So this is basically what AI has been, uh, this is what AI is. And then we decided to take that and we started out doing something called MLOps, which is the last mile in the machine learning life cycle. So basically you start with data, um, you train a model, you like the model, you look at the accuracies, it's good. You wanna push it into production. This is where our tools can come in and really help you push that model into production and maintain it and provision it for you. And then we decided to build that infrastructure and then spin off use cases on top of it. And this is how we generate revenue, right? So we sell use cases specifically in the financial services sector uh, to banks and lenders. And we also have you know, other industry agnostic tools that we also sell across. Okay, perfect. Now, one of the things I really want to delve into is you operate in the finance sector, which is a sector that's highly regulated, highly sensitive. How do you manage that, especially when there's so much fear and stigma around the idea? Like there are people who love AI, and then there's the other side of the spectrum where people are like concerned AI is gonna take over. Uh, I mean, we focus on it heavily, and the way that we do that, we have a research arm dedicated to actually exploring the ethics of AI, the best ways to actually deploy AI, and how can you really remove the biases inside of the database? Because at the end of the day, we build models around data, and this data could already inherently have a lot of biases, right, intrinsically. So how do you clean that up? How do you make sure that you apply the right protocols to scale your, uh, your models out of that? This is something that we really take uh, pride in. I love that you mentioned the biases because this is one of the issues we constantly face. It's like the data is usually not Middle East specific and the Middle Eastern system doesn't necessarily conform to the typical uh, stereotypes of like what is a safe person to lend to. So how do you manage with that data gap? So actually what we do is we train our models based on Middle Eastern data, right? We, 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 we use data that is, it's a green field actually, and we'd be very privileged to be in that space. And not a lot of people have had their hands on the data that we've had our hands on. So our data is super, and this is how we were able to differentiate and really beat off the competition from global players, right? We have uh, uh, inherent data from the region, whether it's Egypt, the Middle East, whatever market that we're exploring. And the data is actually the footprint of the people that are actually applying for the loans as well. So it's super specific on the court or the persona that we're lending to or we're selling that service to, uh, or the actually lender is actually selling their uh, product to. Um, but it's super specific to them and we're not actually using any uh, global standard models that we're calibrating then uh, on the population here. We're actually building models from scratch and we do that for the past six years. So we have a pretty strong database uh, um, uh, and we have a, a pretty significant behavior that entails what those cohorts are behaving. So we have, I think, pretty high in differentiation models um, and we call those, when we look at a, a Gini coefficient, for example, the, the separation is super high with that. So I think we've done a very, very good job on focusing on data of the Middle East to build models for the Middle East. That's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing Appreciate all these insights so much, and congratulations on being an under 30 lister. Thank you so much, Ed. Thank you. Appreciate it.